Would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly gracious Father, as we gather here today, we are indeed thankful again for that opportunity you give to us to hear your word. We pray that this day your hearts, our hearts will be opened through that spirit that comes from you, through the power of your word to learn the truths you would have us to know, and to live the lives you would have us to live. In your name we ask it. Amen. The word of God that I would like to share with you today comes from our first reading. Very interesting section of scripture because it tells the story of after ascension. The opening lines are after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, which was celebrated this last Thursday. And after they ascended into heaven, they came back. We find out there was about 120 of them that would gather together. And they were gathered together who would be, by the way, empowered on Pentecost Sunday, next Sunday, to speak in different languages and share the gospel messages to the Jews who became Christians that were in Jerusalem at the time. But they have this dilemma. Somehow they need 12 apostles. They only have 11. And so the last half of verse 20 of Acts chapter 1 starts reading this way. May another take his place of leadership. Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men whom you have, who, may, who, who has been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us and of his resurrection. Very interesting text because when one looks at this text, there's an interesting question at the end of it. Okay? And that's kind of our theme of our sermon for today. So, you want to be an apostle. Have you ever thought about that? Ever thought about being involved in the work of the church for the Lord? Most of us would never think about being an apostle, but the 12, 11 disciples did. We, we need another, another one of us. We need one who is like us, who would be another apostle. So how are we going to go about doing that? Well, I want you to think about first that question from this perspective. Have any of you ever thought about being in full-time church ministry? Now, I have an interesting story about that. Some of you think that pastors grow up as young boys wanting to be pastors. There are some that do. There's some of us that come in kicking and screaming. All right? When I was a young boy, young child, yeah, I wanted to be a pastor. I thought that was going to be really cool to stand up in front and do the benediction and all those things. Yeah. As I got older, I was going to do something else. And I was at, now this, tell, this is going to date me for, for some of you people more mature in here, you will get this. I was at a Walther League convention, all right? Okay. And while I was there, this pastor I worked with, I was on the district board, he came up to me and he says, you know, Jerry, have you ever thought about being a pastor? I said, oh, when I was young, but I really don't want to be one. And he said, you know, you'd make a good one. What he didn't know about me is I don't like to stand in front of people and talk. I learned how to do it, but I'll tell you different things. No, I didn't want to do that. It was the last thing in the world that I wanted to do. But God had a different way of doing that. And that weekend called me into the teaching, preaching ministry. Now, some of us who have been called into full-time ministry, God has called us that way. But there's many of you that have never been called or maybe never thought about pursuing full-time ministry, either as a pastor or a teacher or as a deaconess. There's DCE, there's... Minister of Music, there's all kinds of openings for God's people to serve full-time. But there's also that great 
power that God gives to each congregation for people to serve and minister using their gifts and talents. And that's one of the things that our text is going to share with us today. You know, it's really interesting when one thinks about the church, about what to be involved in ministry. This last weekend, the we, last few days, Libby and I were in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was there because it was my celebrating 45 years of being ordained, graduating from the seminary alumni reunion, and it was disappointing that more of my classmates weren't there, but the ones that were there and other ones that I knew from other years, we had a great time, and to be on campus and to, to see all these young pastors that are preparing, it was graduation weekend, and to be involved in that was a great experience. It reminded me of why the Lord had called me into ministry. Now, it was interesting in that we, we had an experience to share memories of our days at the seminary. And I had one in the back of my mind that I didn't share it publicly, but shared with a few of my friends that were there. About when we were on campus, you know, some, sometimes people think they're too old to do ministry, right? Oh, that's for the young guys to do. That's for the younger people to do. I'm just too old. My first year at the seminary, there was a guy that was graduating who was 64 years old. He'd came, he had come to the seminary at the age 60 to be a pastor. His name was Joe. We couldn't remember his last name, but we remember his name was Joe. He was an older guy. We'd see him walking around campus. The first time we saw him, we thought he was somebody's grandfather <laughs> here visiting. He said, no, Joe's a student. A student? Yeah, he was a student. And you know why he went to the seminary? I asked him one day, I said, Joe, what, what led you to go into the ministry? He said, I want to do mission work. And I'm thinking, you're 64, 64 years old. He ended up doing about 10 to 15 years before he retired again. And he went to Canada and did mission work up there when he graduated. So, do you want to be an apostle? Do you want to be involved in ministry? It's very interesting how people react when you say you want to be a pastor. I have stories I could share with you about classmates that when they find out now from Teachers College that I'm a pastor, had one couple, well, about a month ago, had lunch with one I hadn't seen in 50 years. And he said, he can't be a pastor, why? He was too wild and ornery when he was at the seminary, at college to be a pastor. Well, we all have different gifts and talents that God wants to use. So. Do you want to be an apostle? That's a tough question to ask because one of the things with that is that there's some qualifications that they laid out in our text. It's not going to work with me today. All right. First of all, the first qualification that our text said, in order to be an apostle, these are what the three qualifies, qualifications are that Scripture says. First of all, you had to have been with Jesus from the time he began his ministry till he went into heaven. Second, second qualification is you had to have had seen the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And the third one was, which isn't always specifically spell, spelled out in the book of Acts, but is prominent throughout the rest of the New Testament, is that you had to be called directly by Jesus or God to go into this ministry. Remember, Jesus called Matthew, and he called James and John and Peter and all the other disciples. He called them to follow him. He probably called Matthias and Justice also. All right, maybe more a little more indirectly, but he probably, when they were following or coming, he said, why don't you follow along and learn more from me? So when they got ready to choose from the 120, they had only these two men that fit that quali that, those qualities, and they chose that one. Now, what makes this so interesting is, is that when we get to the point of 
later on, there's another, there is a 13th apostle that comes along in the scriptures, all right? That was the apostle Paul. Now, he, it's very interesting because he sees the resurrected Lord when God calls him, when Jesus calls him into ministry. So two qualities are filled right away on the road to Damascus. The third one is always the toughest one for the church to figure out. Okay. When was he taught by Jesus? When did Jesus speak with him and teach him the truths he needed to know? But it was interesting. The early church never confronted or challenged Paul on being an apostle. So that, that raises an interesting question today. Do we have apostles that exist in our world today? Are there apostles that fit that category that we could do that? Well, being taught by Jesus, that's pretty easy to follow, right? We have the word of God. We have God's word. We've heard it twice today. We heard the book of Acts. We heard the gospel reading. We have taught Bible class. We learned in confirmation. We've learned in adult instruction. We learned the word of God. So we've been taught. All right, we got that one filled, all right? Being called by Jesus. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just as I was called and many others were called into the ministry, some more dramatically than others, some very indirectly. But God has called us to be set aside, to be set apart, be trained and equipped to come and share God's word. The third one gets a little tough. Seeing the resurrected Jesus. No, I have not. Now, have some people do that? I don't, don't know for sure. I've never doubted when people tell me that they had a vision and they saw the resurrected Jesus. Because, you know, God works in strange and mysterious ways. Who am I to say that God cannot give to you or to a person that vision to see him face to face? To see him this side of heaven, either in a vision or stand before you in a dream or however that may be. I don't know. It's not happened to me. But for the most part, we in the church say that it probably didn't happen. It probably doesn't occur. And so with those churches that practice that, have apostles, really the struggle that we have with them is how do you prove that? How do you go about doing that? So the apostolic age probably ended with the apostle Paul and the early apostles. Apostles as we know them in the way the scriptures laid them out. But there's an interesting part of our text that is connected with that word apostle, which means to be a messenger, to be one who is sent, one who goes out and shares the word. You're also to be a witness. The Greek word for witness is martyr. Now, when most of us think of the word martyr, we think of those who die for the faith. The gift of martyrdom is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. By the way, it's the only gift of the Holy Spirit you can only use once. You can't be a multiple martyr, not that I know of, all right? By the biblical sense of what we think. Martyrdom. Those who are willing to die for the faith. Those who are willing to, who've made that decision now, by the way, you have to make it now. You can't make that decision when they lean you, lay, line you up against the wall and say, are you going to deny the faith or are you going to die for the faith? And you, and you say, go ahead and pull the trigger because I'm going to die for the faith. Because it's very easy in that emotional moment to say, well, I'll tell them I'm going to deny, but I'm not really going to. No. The true gift of martyrdom is you've made that decision now. The true witness. Now, What's interesting is that that word martyrdom doesn't always mean that you become, or the word witness, doesn't mean you're always going to die for the faith. 
You're not going to die by sharing the gospel. Now, in some situations, you are. And of the 12 apostles, the 13 apostles, counting Apostle Paul, 12 of them died for the faith. Only the Apostle John died a natural death. He suffered and was persecuted, but he didn't die for witnessing for Jesus Christ. You may suffer and be persecuted for sharing the gospel message, for telling people that they are sinners, that telling them the joy of forgiveness that comes from the cross, that telling them the great Easter joy and the promise of eternal life that people don't want to hear, don't want to believe. You may be persecuted for believing that because they don't think it's true. You may be laughed at. You may even be physically harmed. But many times you may not die for doing that. Witnessing is what God has called us all to do. But sometimes it's just hard to do. My members know this about me. When it comes to spiritual gifts, one of the gifts I don't have or don't, I do not have the gift of evangelism. Now, the true gift of evangelism is this, that you go undaunted from door to door Knock on them, and if the people say, I don't want to talk, you say, all right, I'll go to the next door and go on, all right? I don't have that gift. I'll talk to anybody and share the message of Jesus with you, but I don't like to do that, and I have done it plenty of times. You know how I know I don't have the gift? Because when I get to the door and ring the doorbell, you know what my prayer is? Please, Lord, don't let them be home. And then they're not home, and I go, then I have to go to the next door. <laughs> Ring the doorbell. And when they open it and talk, I'm all right. But, okay, does that mean that, I, that I'm not supposed to witness? No. You see, we're all called to be witnesses. We're all taught, called to talk about and tell people about sin, about their sins. How they break, how they've broken the laws of God. Right? That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. The Ten Commandments are the, those guidelines for us to follow, but they're also a reminder. Remember, they're a mirror. Why? Because when we look at a mirror, we see who we are and what we have done wrong. And that's what we point out to people. Look at that's what these Ten Commandments show you. They're not saying that you've broken every one of them, but you've broken them. But there is hope, there is joy, there is a cross, there is forgiveness. The man Jesus, God's son, came to this earth to be like us, to be the God-man, to be the perfect sacrifice, to die on the cross and by his blood being shed, we are forgiven of our sins. But it doesn't end there. We have that Easter joy. Easter isn't just about that celebration of Easter eggs and bunnies. It's about that open tomb and the promise that one day our graves will be open. But till that time, those of us that have that faith in Jesus when we die, we'll be in heaven with him and our loved ones. That's the promise and hope of the good news that we are called to witness. So how does one go about doing that? How does one go about talking about the message of salvation in a world that doesn't want to hear about it? Well, the easiest way to do that is to just tell people what Jesus means to you. You don't have to learn this organized, long way to share the gospel message. Just tell people what Jesus means to you. What does Jesus really mean to you in your life? What does, what does knowing Jesus and having Jesus and having this forgiveness, what does that really mean to you in your daily walk? What kind of joy does it give you? 
gives you that power and that presence that on Sunday mornings you get up and you come and worship. Why? Because you want to be in this place. You want to hear that word again. You want to be strengthened. You want to be with your fellow believers. You want to dine at his table and receive again that body and blood of Jesus Christ. Because we've all been called to be witnesses. You were called when you were baptized. You were called in a very special way. Right? The sign of the cross, both upon your forehead and over your heart, to mark you as re one redeemed by Christ the crucified. That's God's calling you to be his child. How do you know that? Because when we baptize you, we baptize you by name. We just don't say, hey, you, you're baptized. We say your name to show you that God is calling you to be one of his special children. And because you're special to him, he wants you to be special to the world. He calls you to witness, to tell of him and his love to the world. So, do you want to be an apostle? Well, maybe I can't be an apostle, but I can be a messenger, and a witness for him. And I pray God will use you to do that each and every day in his name. Amen. And now the peace of God, which is beyond all human understanding and comprehension, may keep our hearts and minds fixed on that cross and his great love for us. And may we continue to be empowered by his spirit and his presence to proclaim that word to a world in desperate need of it. In his name, we ask it.